Okay, every, ladies and gentlemen, we want, uh, we want to get started, and I want to say uh, thank you for coming out on a rainy Friday. Normally this would produce about, you know, seven people that are retired and don't have anything else to do, and it's kind of the way they fill up their day by going to think tank events. And, uh, but this, this looks like it's a 12-step recovery team that's <laughs> been through this before, uh, and the question is, well, will we get it right or better this time? You know, uh, the, the, I'm, I, this is, I'm John Hamry uh, here at CSIS and uh, uh, want to say welcome to all of you and thank you for coming. I, uh, I feel like a little bit, uh, uh, that, that Groundhog movie, you know, I mean, uh, we've woken up again and here we are. Um, this, this, been, this has been promised for several, several years, but uh, it looks like now we're there. And the question is, are we going to do it better this time than we did the last time? Uh, you know, and of course everybody says well, we, won't, we, we won't do that again. Uh, or are we going to make the same mistakes all over again? I mean, and there is, uh, it isn't that people choose to, uh, to, do, to make mistakes, it's that the dynamic that uh, that governs all of the complex actions that brings several th hundred thousand people together to make choices produces outcomes. And the question is, is can we with thought and direction and intelligence supersede that? Uh, and we're at the front end of trying to think that through. Uh, we need to do that, uh, thinking that through with all of you. We saw the, the first uh, kind of details uh, here uh, yesterday. Lots more yet to unfold. I think we're really just on the front end of this. Uh, we do see the, the large central direction, hey Paul. Uh, it's a large central direction where this is heading. And it is grounded in, in a strategy that's, that I think has fairly broad consensus uh, in, in town and in the country. Uh, but uh, but what what all budgets you know they have to have a certain policy coherence at the top, but then the details really matter, you know they really matter, and that's where we're now starting to get to that deeper phase, and we're going to try to under understand all of that. Uh, I would uh, I would again like to say thank you to our friends at Rolls Royce that make it possible for us to offer this policy series to the defense community in Washington. And uh, let me turn it to you. David, are you going to, are you in charge of this motley bunch that's going to guide us through the, this or? More or less. More or less. A little, little less than more. But let me, let me turn it over to you. Let me just say thank you again for coming. We look forward to having, this is going to be an ongoing discussion we're going to have to have because it's going to take some time for us to understand where we're heading and what it means. And we're appreciative of all of you coming and you're going to have to be a part of that. David, let me turn to you. Thanks, thank you. Sir. Good morning and, and welcome not only to those of you in the room, but to our uh, audience uh, on the web. We're webcasting this at, on CSIS and also to our viewers on C-SPAN and we're grateful uh, for the opportunity to reach a, a larger audience that way. A uh, couple of administrative details. Uh, uh, if you would, in fact, uh, those of you in the room, silence your cell phones and, and other noise devices, uh, I would appreciate it. Um, I've just tried to make sure that mine are silent as well. Uh, for those of you who are viewing on the web and uh, when it comes to questions, if you would like to email questions to us, uh, you can do that uh, to my email, dberto at csis.org, and, uh, and we'll try to answer those questions as well uh, if we like them and uh, otherwise we'll ignore them. We can't quite do that with the ones in the room, obviously. Um, the, the panel that we have today is particularly well suited to addressing what's essentially an issue of where are we in the defense budget drawdown at a time where we have some information, enough to actually speculate about what it really means, but not really enough to know what it really is, right? Uh, we had in, in January, earlier in January, we had the new strategic guidance issued by the Defense Department. Yesterday, we had Secretary Panetta, uh, General Dempsey, the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, and uh, some of the other Pentagon officials elaborating a little bit over how that strategic guidance is going to be reflected in the reductions and also what some of those reductions look like. But in both of those cases, that is the President's announcement three weeks ago and the Secretary's announcement yesterday, it actually raises more questions than it answers. Uh, 
So what we're going to try to do this morning is fill in a little bit based upon our uh, knowledge, experience, and pure speculation on, uh, on what some of those might turn out to be. So uh, the way I would like to proceed, I've actually got a little overview set of charts here, and uh, uh, those will be posted on the web as well afterwards for those of you who'd like to get through them. I want to run through those very quickly, make a couple of additional comments, and then I will introduce our panel and turn to them. And we intend to have a lot of time for questions at the end uh, as well, so thank you. Um, let me get, have the next chart. Uh, this is not the first time, of course, that we've brought the defense budget down. And this chart actually takes you back to uh, the pre-Korean War period. We had a build-up, another drawdown, build-up, drawdown. The bars, if you will, the blue bars are the uh, uh, base budget amounts that uh, the Defense Department put into place. Uh, the little white bars on top are the supplementals, that is, the funding that was done on an emergency supplemental basis. You'll see that while there's a substantial amount of that uh, in the recent years, that is, the post-9-11, big chunks of money being appropriated under uh, emergency appropriations, or as the Pentagon calls it now, OCO, the Overseas Contingency Operations Account. But the same was true, actually, in Korea and Vietnam in terms of large numbers and a little bit in the Balkans uh, during the 90s. So the process is that you, we do go up and we come back down again. There's also a black line on this chart and the black line allows you to see that the up and down is not just dollars, it's also the active duty in strength. And, uh, and it, there tends to be a correlation between when the budget's going up, the end strength goes up. When the budget's coming down, the end strength is going down. It's not purely cause and effect. One of the challenges and one of the ways in which it's different this time is even though there are some end strength reductions projected in the budget, they're not commensurate necessarily with uh, the long-term dollar reductions that we anticipate. Let me have the next chart. This actually allows you to see that in, in a numerical way, if you will. Um, what you have on this chart is, is the four drawdowns, the post-Korean War, the post-Vietnam War, the post-Cold War. And even though we don't actually yet have a name for the current drawdown, uh, we, for purposes of this chart, call it the Post-Budget Control Act. I don't think that's actually a name that will catch on and survive over the decades. Um, so we're seeking a new and better name for it. Uh, we thought actually about putting post question mark on the chart here. But that does allow you actually to, to sort of benchmark uh, the, the, the peak and the trough. So what you have on the, on the first column is the peak, and those dollars are, in fact, in um, um, millions. So it's really $717 billion is the peak. Um, and the, the, the trough, and that's a projected trough for the, the post-Budget uh, Control Act of about $567 million. That includes base budget and overseas contingency operations uh, as laid out in yesterday's announcement by, by the Secretary. So those numbers are updated as of yesterday. It's a reduction of about 21%. That compares, in fact, with reductions of 43%, 31%, and 36% in previous drawdowns. So on a pure percentage basis, this drawdown is not as dramatic as the previous three have been. On the right-hand side, you have active duty troops, 32%, 43%, 35%, and a 7% reduction. That's where the challenge lies. If in fact we're taking a drawdown that on a percentage basis is three times higher than the percentage reduction in active duty in strength, that implies there will be pressure in this budget on something other than personnel costs. And that's one of the dramatic challenges we face. Let me have the next chart. Um, this actually just depicts it uh, notionally so you can see that in fact uh, for today, uh, the steepness of the curve is not that much uh, less uh, for dollars. The steepness of the manpower is, of course, virtually non-existent. And final chart, um, just a timeline. How did we get here? You know, last February, the president submitted his FY12 budget. And by the way, all of the numbers calculating how much the budget is down is off of the benchmark of the president's budget request from two th for 2012, including the out years of that request. That request had a significant increase. So in typical Washington parlance, a reduction is not necessarily a reduction. It doesn't necessarily mean you have less money next year than you had last year. What it actually means is you had less money this year than you had originally planned to have this year. That's the nature of these reductions. Uh, and, and in fact, in terms of the actual year-over-year uh, -year spending, really only fiscal year 13 base budget, which is the budget about to be proposed by the president, 
compared to fiscal year 12, that's the only real reduction in real dollars. The other years are essentially when inflation is taken into account flat. But the reduction of the $487 billion that the Secretary talked about yesterday over the 10-year period, that reduction is from what they planned to spend. So Congress back in April, you remember, passed the full year continuing resolution. That CR had in it a defense appropriations bill for FY11. Um, then in August, uh, as we were sort of railing about about whether we were going to default as a, as a nation or not, uh, the Budget Control Act was passed. That set a fiscal year 12 cap for all of national security. The Defense Department gets a share, the lion's share of that reduction. And it set a cap for fiscal year 13. It also set in place, of course, the Super Committee. Um, we know where that ended up uh, right in the Monday before Thanksgiving. The Super Committee announced that uh, they had failed to achieve uh, one of their objectives, which was come up with numbers. They had, in fact, achieved another one of their objectives, which is they had universal agreement that it was the other guy's fault. And so uh, they, they did achieve that goal. Um, but, uh, but what that set in place is a trigger that said, okay, there are now additional cuts to come through sequestration. That sequestration um, kicks in on January 2nd, 2013. Um, that's a very magic date. It happens to be uh, after the presidential election uh, and the congressional election in 2012, but before any of the individuals who are elected in that election actually take office which means that if anything's going to be done about that sequestration, it's going to have to be done by the 112th Congress, the Congress we have today. So um, the baseline then for the budget that we're going to be discussing this morning, the fiscal year 13 budget, is actually the fiscal year 2012 appropriations, which was passed by Congress late in December. Um, there are two interesting dynamics at work here uh, that we'll come back to over the course of the morning. One is that the Secretary of Defense has made it clear that he anticipates the reductions that he's taken so far you know, are all that he wants to take. He does not want sequestration, and he stated that crystal clear yesterday. Now, there is a little bit of ambiguity in room, and we'll look at some of the nuances, if you will, because w when you actually don't have numbers, you have to look at words. And the words yesterday have a little bit of deviation between the written word that was approved by the communications professionals for the document, the spoken words in the actual transcript of the uh, speech, and the expected words of what's really going to happen. And we'll look at some of those nuances as we go. Nonetheless, the law of the land is sequestration will take effect unless it changes. The Pentagon has said, we don't think that should happen. The President, on the other hand, has stated unequivocally, unambiguously, I will veto any attempt to change the sequestration. So this is a little bit of a strategic political dilemma for the Defense Department. On the one hand, I don't want to take any more cuts, and I've actually got a President who seems to be in line with that because this is his budget. On the other hand, I've got a President who says he's going to veto any attempt to relieve me from the responsibility of taking more cuts. That's a strategic dilemma that's going to hang over us this entire budget season, if you will. So with that, I'm going to throw the uh, floor open to our panel here. Um, we're joined by three wonderful people to comment on this this morning. Um, Todd Harrison is the senior uh, budget person for the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. He has a constant, never ceasingly amazing ability uh, to find uh, uh, useful information in budgetary process that, um, that I love to take advantage of. Um, he'll be followed by Stephanie Sanek, who is a senior fellow here in the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and Clark Murdoch, who is a senior advisor here at CSIS. Then I'll provide a few wrap-up comments, and then we'll open the floor for questions. So um, Todd, are you going to talk from there, or you want to come up here? be happy to talk from here. Good. I'll slide this back then so we can see the audience. Thanks. Right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out on this rainy uh, day here in Washington. Um, you know, I'll just start by saying that the, the numbers that came out yesterday uh, are really not that much of a surprise. Uh, the base budget for DOD, so that's not including war funding, is going to be $525 billion. Uh, war funding uh, will be about $88 billion. Uh, this is really driven by the Budget Control Act. Uh, that was the deal passed by Congress uh, last August uh, that allowed uh, the President to raise the debt ceiling. That put caps on the defense budget for the rest of the decade, uh, and that is what is driving this budget. Uh, you know, 
the real question now is uh, the budget. Does it reflect the new strategic guidance the department came out with back on January 5th? And fundamentally, when you're talking about strategy, you're talking about choices. Any strategy is really about choices. Those choices are often expressed in the budget, so that's why we're looking for details uh, about what the strategy really means in terms of choices <laughs> in the budget. Uh, so where did they cut? Uh, and are those cuts consistent with the strategic guidance? Uh, they obviously uh, talked to, uh, to a great extent about cuts in ground forces. Uh, they're taking the Army uh, down uh, to a pre-9-11 size, about 490,000 in, in strength. Uh, they're taking the Marine Corps down as well to 182,000 in strength. Uh, and these were expected, uh, but they did not spare the other services from cuts either. Uh, they're taking about 17 ships out of the Navy over the fight up. They're retiring 10% uh, of the Air Force's fighter squadrons. Uh, they slipped some major programs, programs that seem to play in the new strategy, uh, like the Joint Strike Fighter, like the Virginia class submarines. Uh, so really, no one was spared in this. Uh, you know, given the, the delta from what uh, the Pentagon had been planning, the growth they had been planning uh, in last year's budget to the relatively flat budget uh, that they're constrained to now, uh, it did require painful choices across the board. Uh, the three things I'm going to be looking for, though, when the details of the budget come out uh, are, are the following. First, uh, the budget share of each of the services. Uh, you know, it's interesting that, you know, throughout time the services have tended to maintain relatively equal budget shares over the years. Now, when you include war funding over the past decade, clearly the Army and Marine Corps uh, got a, a much greater share of that. Uh, but I went back and looked at last year's budget request, the five-year plan that they put out, uh, and they already showed last year that the Air Force was going to gradually increase its budget share uh, over the five-year plan. The Army would gradually lose budget share uh, over those five years, and the Navy Marine Corps, uh, they're basically going to stay flat. So one of the things I'll be looking for when the new budget comes out, uh, the strategy says we're going to place more emphasis on air and sea forces, less emphasis on ground forces. So are they going to accelerate that shift? and budget share, or is it basically going to stay uh, at what they were predicting they were going to do in the last budget? The second thing I'll be looking for uh, is the mix of active component versus Guard and Reserve component forces. It's so one of the things the uh, Secretary talked about uh, a bit yesterday. We don't have a lot of details yet, uh, but it sounds like the uh, Army is, while they're making major cuts in the active duty force, there'll be smaller cuts in the Guard and Reserve. Um, the Air Force may actually be going in the other direction. Uh, they may be cutting more deeply in their reserve component in order to protect uh, some critical parts of their active component. So that's one of the trade-offs, one of the competitions in the budget I'll be watching as well. The third one, and this is uh, one that we don't, often don't like to talk about uh, because it's very politically sensitive, uh, but nevertheless it is a real competition going on in the budget between retirees and active duty. Uh, what I'm talking about here is what the Pentagon has to budget and pay every year for retirement benefits, not just retirement pay, but health care as well, versus what they're doing to support the active duty troops in terms of pay and benefits. Uh, we didn't get a lot of details yesterday. Uh, they talked about creating a commission uh, to go out and look at uh, options for reforming the military retirement system. I actually think this is a great idea. I think this is a good approach because you don't want to go into this uh, in a haphazard manner and just start saying, well, you know, we think we can cut this, we think we can cut that. You don't want to end up with another redux. Uh, you know, back in you know, the mid-1980s, uh, we had this great idea that we would just cut the retirement benefit. Redux, I think it stands for reduction. Um, and, you know, so the idea was we're just going to make a, a sudden shift. Everyone who enters the service from now on, they're going to get less uh, of a retirement benefit. Uh, well, that didn't hold. Uh, it created this, uh, you know, uh, discrepancy within the, the force where as we got closer to, you know, 20 years after that point when people would actually start retiring under the new benefits, uh, we balked uh, and we, we went back to the old system. Uh, so hopefully, you know, if this retirement uh, commission does get formed, they'll take a, a broader view of this. This shouldn't be about finding ways to cut. It should be about finding ways to get better value. 
Uh, they do this in the private sector. It's called preference-based benefits optimization. Companies do this all the time. You need to understand before you start making changes how people value various components of their compensation. And then you can make smart trade-offs. And if they do not value something commensurate with what it's costing you to provide, maybe you cut that and give them something else where they are getting good value out of it. Uh, so I think uh, I hold out hope uh, that this commission, that Congress uh, will take a serious look at this uh, and perhaps get the legislation together uh, uh, to, to bring that forward. Uh, but overall, you know, what are the trades we're seeing in the budget? Personnel costs make up about a third of the Pentagon's budget. Uh, when you include military personnel costs plus the defense health program, it's about a third of the Pentagon budget. And what they said yesterday is personnel costs are only taking one-ninth of the cuts. Uh, so that means that other parts of the budget are going to take a disproportionate share of the cuts because ultimately this is a zero-sum game. They have a budget cap required by the Budget Control Act they've got to fit in. Uh, so procurement, I think, is actually going to get hit the hardest. Uh, we heard a lot uh, of the program decisions yesterday. I imagine there are many more we have yet to hear, uh, and those will, will come out over the coming days and weeks. Uh, the total savings that they're talking about, and again, this is – the savings relative to last year's budget, uh, it's $259 billion over the five-year plan. 25% of those savings are supposed to come from efficiencies. That's another $60 billion in efficiencies on top of $178 billion in efficiencies that was in last year's budget. Uh, Boy, that, that's, that's very uh, <laughs> optimistic to think that you can find all those efficiencies. Uh, I think it is incredibly risky to be banking on those savings before they've been achieved. It is always a good goal uh, to try to find efficiencies, to try to get more efficient, to root out waste wherever you can uh, in any government agency, in any organization, uh, but to go ahead and bank on those savings for a quarter of what you're doing in this budget uh, I think is a bit risky. If those savings don't materialize, where are the savings going to come from? This is a zero-sum game. They're going to have to come from something else, and that's going to be a hard decision. Uh, the BRAC proposal, I thought, was uh, also interesting because, number one, they're not banking on any savings from it, and that's fair because if you do another round of base closures now, you're not going to get any savings in the next five years. In fact, it's probably going to cost you a little money. They also did not budget for the cost of another round of BRAC. Uh, so I would not read in, in too much into the suggestion that we're going to have another round of base closures. Uh, I think this is a notional idea right now, and in an election year, I think it's highly unlikely uh, that Congress is going to want to enact that legislation. Uh, the, the final point I'll make is, and I've made this before, uh, is that this budget and this strategy do not prepare for the possibility of sequestration. That is a real uh, possibility. Uh, I, I would not say it is highly likely to occur, uh, but I would say that it, there is a finite chance it really will happen because it is the law of the land, and if Congress does nothing, if there's gridlock, uh, it will happen by default on January 2nd next year. Uh, they presented the budget as a package deal, a take it or leave it, um, this is what you've got. The reality is that's not going to hold. Uh, you know, there are some things in there Congress isn't going to go along with, uh, and there are probably further cuts are going to be needed in the years to come. Even if we avoid sequestration, it's optimistic to think that the defense budget is just going to flatten out for the rest of the decade. Uh, history shows that that just doesn't tend to happen. Uh, so they, they talked a lot about how the strategy was flexible, adaptable, agile, versatile, um, beginning to think that they need to, to budget in the Pentagon for a new thesaurus. They're, using those words so many times. Um, but, you know, the same should be true of the budget. Uh, it's got to be flexible and adaptable. And the reality here uh, is that further cuts are likely, even if we avoid sequestration, uh, the defense budget is likely to still decline uh, in the years to come. Uh, so, you know, I would urge the Pentagon to start working on a plan B. And if it means you have to start over uh, and come up with a new strategy that is more flexible and adaptable to the budget environment, then so be it. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, uh, Todd. Uh, Stephanie, you want to pick it up from here? Absolutely. Uh, good morning, and again, thank you for, for joining us this morning. I have a different interest in tracking uh, yesterday's announcements. Um, my perspective 
looks at programmatic details, but also the strategic implications and the kinds of risks that these documents that we've seen, whether it's the strategy or the strategic guidance that was uh, promulgated earlier this month or yesterday's budgetary announcements. Um, I will say that details really do matter. Um, we don't have sufficient detail about the budget right now to make um, specific um, recommendations or to cast particular stones um, at, at uh, considerations or decisions that were made. So I'm waiting with bated breath for the delayed um, budget to come out in a couple of weeks. But in the meantime, what we can go over is the broader context. And I'm thinking more about what does the budget information say about our, our nation's national security priorities? What is the st strategic con uh, context in which we should judge whether these are the right or the wrong decisions? My starting point is the strategic guidance that was um, released on January 5th. What are the um, assumptions, the risks, and the priorities laid out in that guidance? And so, like Secretary Panetta, I would just like to provide an overview of what the five key elements were. You probably all know these, but it's worth uh, repeating in this forum. One, that the military will be smaller and leaner, but yet it will maintain agil agility, flexibility, and its technological advantages. Um, we will rebalance our global posture. We'll b build innovative partnerships, defeat aggression from any adversary, and protect and prioritize key investments. That is motherhood and apple pie. Uh, so when Dr. Hamry says there's broad consensus, absolutely. Uh, who could really argue with any of those things? In fact, if you go back to the Bush administration's first QDR, it said pretty much the same things. Um, but as we know, that QDR lasted roughly eight to nine months before the global strategic environment caused huge shifts. This is back in 2001. And so what I'm wondering, is what the budget information that we've gotten talks about reversibility. It talks about key partnerships. It talks about the kinds of wars that we're going to be facing, or rather the conflicts that we're going to be facing in the near future. And I have some concerns, because um, I'm at a think tank and that's what we do. We have concerns. Um, <laughs> first, it, it appears to me from yesterday's announcements that the primary planning scenario is a high-tech war. If you look at where they're placing their investments, uh, what they're getting rid of, um, they are not contemplating kind of the low intensity conflict or stability operations environment in which we've been operating for the last few years. Um, and so I have some concerns about um, kind of de-emphasizing some of the capabilities that we've been developing over the last few years. I'm not saying we shouldn't invest in cyber technologies, in space. Those are certainly very important and really things that only the state can handle in certain aspects of protection. Um, we've heard a lot about the air-sea battle um, and the budget review or um, preview yesterday seemed to affirm that. It actually says in the strategic guidance and in yesterday's announcements that the Defense Department is not anticipating a prolonged large-scale stability operations that require land forces in a rotational basis. Okay. What in the strategic environment leads them to think that? If you look at undergoverned spaces, ungoverned spaces, the probability of civil wars, the probability of long-term instability, I'm not sure why they draw that conclusion. The large scale might be the, the sticking point, but I would argue that from a U.S. perspective, we certainly do have an interest in maintaining a capability to address instability in places like the Maghreb, Trans-Sahara, in the Middle East and in Asia. And so I wonder about this planning scenario, which appears to be high tech, um, but which ignores kind of the lessons learned over the last few years. That leads me to my second set of concerns, which are focused on these innovative partnerships. So if the US is going to focus on technology, who's going to handle the rest of the issues? We have something called Global Train and Equip in the Department of Defense to train military forces around the world to handle counterterrorism operations and stability operations. Will we see an increase in that activity? Are we going to pe depend on partners, whether it's the United Kingdom, whether it's Mali, to address some of the concerns that really we have the capabilities now to address, but we might not in the future because of this transition? So that's something I'm going to be watching closely. What are we asking our partners to do? Last year, the United Kingdom came out with their Strategic Defense and Security Review, and we talked to them about, as a nation, about what are they giving up. 
I wonder whether we had similar conversations before the rollout of this new strategic guidance and this budget with our reliable shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder partners. Have we talked to the Brits and the Australians enough about what we are giving up, what strategic risks we as a nation are willing to accept, and therefore, as our partners, are they going to accept the same risks or are they going to fill that niche? How did those conversations go? Based on my experience, they probably went very quickly. <laughs> they probably went about two days before anything was rolled out and we called them consultations. Um, I, I, it remains to be seen what our partners can do. That's one set of partners and David and I have talked at length about building partnership cap capability within existing partners who are capable. You know, the Brits, the Germans, the French, what are we doing to help them um, with their capabilities and capacities versus innovative partnerships, which I think is um, the executive branch's code for, you know, partners that we don't, non-traditional partners, can we call them that? The Malians, the Chadians, um, the Indonesians, um, what are we doing with them? And I wonder um, how this new budget information will impact those relationships. I'm not quite sure what innovative partnerships mean. And my third set of concerns hinges on this word reversibility. Now, it used to be in vogue to use transformation, rebalancing. What does reversibility mean? When you're talking about early retirement, how do you unretire something? If you're talking about slowing procurement, I can maybe see trying to re-energize a production line. But from an industrial perspective, what does reversibility mean? Is it possible? Did defense officials walk the factory floors and go, okay, if we slow procurement and you have to slow down your production line, how fast can we revitalize it if we need to? Uh, this was something we saw, obviously, with up-armoring Humvees uh, not too long ago. And actually having members of Congress go out and walk factory floors. Bob Simmons, who's the current um, staff director of the House Armed Services Committee, takes great pride in, in, in talking about really focusing the, the executive branch on what it means to, to use the industrial base. I know Secretary Panetta mentioned protecting, uh, well, we won't use the word protecting, um, working with the industrial base to have a strong one. I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure what they've done um, to ensure that that happens. When you terminate Global Hawk, how do you unterminate it? How is it reversible? And so that's the, the third set of concerns that I'm, that I'm looking at. And with that, I will turn the floor over, I guess, to Clark uh, for final comments. Thank you. It's always a little daunting to come at the end, particularly when three such competent and professional colleagues preceded you. But nevertheless, in much the same way that Stephanie defines her role as a think tank as, a think tank as having concerns, my role at a think tank is to talk when I'm asked to talk. So I will do that. But I'll try to keep it blessedly short so we get to questions. Um, one of the things that we constantly look at in Washington are the interplay, or those of us who watch the Pentagon, between strategy and resources. We usually talk about the strategy resources mismatch, where we're not spending enough resources to execute the strategy. It's very interesting that we had a base budget that had a strategy, the 2010 Quadriennial Defense Review Strategy. It was right there. Then that defense budget, when it projected a 1% increase in uh, real dollars, was flattened. Actually, not completely flattened. As President Obama said, there was a slight increase to the defense budget over the FIDIP. Yet we have a new strategy. Uh, I, I put together along with a colleague of mine, Kim Wincup, a defense drawdown working group. And we had a big debate between us as what, what's the difference between a strategy and strategic guidance? That the two, the five January strategic guidance, well, that's really just guidance emanating from the 2010 strategy. Uh, but that was dispelled right away because both Panetta and General Dempsey referred to it as a new strategy, even though it's a strategic guidance. Uh, it's true, more uh, attention paid to the precise priorities within it, uh, but if we had had any doubt whether or not it was a new strategy, it is a new strategy. Well, the sequester is another 600 billion, or maybe 575 billion, depending on how you estimate it. Will that mean that we have another new strategy? Well, if you talk to Winnie Phil, he says, well, sequester is like taking, I think his phrase was, a chainsaw to the budget. And out of the rubble of the budget, you create a new strategy. Um, I'm actually a strategist, 
And I hadn't realized that our strategies were so vulnerable to relatively modest changes in the resource level. Because we've been told right now, um, well, the first strategy couldn't withstand a 1% decrement. And now we have another decrement, there might be another 5 to 6%, and we'll have a new strategy out of the rubble of the old budget. So I'm, I really think that our strategies need to be a little bit more robust than that. Uh, and maybe we should be, as Todd has said, looking further ahead to say, well, maybe we might have a real reduction, a real reduction along the lines of the 25 to 35% of past deductions, of reductions, and we should think about what are our priorities under those circumstances, and then cast backwards. Rather than be where we are now, every time there's an increment, we say we've got a new strategy. Um, secondly, question was asked uh, often in the commentary that I didn't have time to read this morning, um, there's not a lot of big cuts here. You know, there's no big showy, gaudy cuts. And uh, doesn't this reflect the fact that uh, there's no real pain? And uh, in the press conference yesterday, they were all very eager to say, lots of hard decisions, very complex, um, very tough. I think uh, Carter said at one point, there are 50 or 60 things in this budget that we want to do but can't afford to do anymore. I would argue, this is just a subtle version of the Washington Monument strategy. There's lots of big cuts out there. They could have taken off the 11th carrier. They could have done deeper cuts and ground forces. Those are all standing right there, but they're for the negotiation over what's going to replace sequester. Nobody wants sequester because it's across the board, meat acts, and it's got a very deep rate of reduction. This is a point that Todd has made, is it's not just the size of the reduction, it's how <coughs> steeply it's administered during that time. So there's going to be a negotiation over what will replace sequester, because the only way to avoid sequester is to have an agreement to replace a sequester. And that will involve, I believe, more cuts to defense. It'll be a more reasonable glide path. It will be targeted. It won't be across <coughs> the board the way the sequester mechanism uh, 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 illustrates. And I think the other thing that it underscores is that we have to do something about pay and benefits. Uh, the, benef the Pentagon has been saying for several years now, our current rate of increase is unsustainable. One of my colleagues at a working group meeting said, and this was before the announcements of yesterday, that if you look at current trend lines, if you look at current trend lines and you hold the budget flat by some year, 2039 or something like that, all we can afford are military personnel costs. It's like the Norm Augustine issue, but not with all we can afford is one large aircraft. It is all we can afford is people, nothing to equip them with, nothing to make them ready. So I think there's no question that out of this, the hope in the Pentagon is we have to do something to stabilize pay and benefits so as to leave resources to equip them, to train them, because everyone is determined to avoid the <coughs> hollow force. Well, one thing to avoid with a hollow force is retaining too much force structure. Because when you have too much force structure, you underman them, you don't equip them, and you don't train them. I think they're doing a good job of trying to match force structure and force structure cuts along with budgetary reduction cuts. Even though, as the first chart that David put up shows, is that we've had a tremendous increase in the dollars being spent, but not much increase in the end strength. That's what makes this so challenging, is we can't just cut people and get the savings that we need. So I think that the, what we're going to find is out of this process will be finally, you know, the executive branch and the legislative branch come together to do something about <coughs> unsustainable personnel costs, and then deciding how deep that cut will be over what time and at what glide path. Thank you, Clark. Let me provide a few wrap-up comments, if you will, and then we'll uh, open the floor for questions. I, I think it's, it's useful for us to observe that we're not really trying to diminish the difficulty that the Defense Department had in making the decisions associated with the $487 billion of cuts. I, I'm quite confident that inside the room, as the decisions were being debated, it felt really hard. You know, and, and for all the constituents involved in each of those, it was really hard. 
Um, nonetheless, it's, it's fair to say that, you know, there's not a lot of, in fact, visible damage from $487 billion of reductions. And that would lead the casual observer, uh, like an appropriator, to say, surely there must be more. Right. Now, sequestration actually takes more. And there's a great deal of, of language out about sequestration that doesn't actually take into account a careful reading of the law itself. And this is worth pointing out because it, it, the basis of any change to the sequestration process is not going to be the language that's out in the ether. It's going to be the law as passed and signed by the President. That sequestration, unlike all preceding sequestrations back to the original Graham Rudman Hollings Act in the mid 80s, provides enormous flexibility to both the executive branch in general and the Defense Department specifically in allocating sequestration cuts across a broader base. All previous sequestrations were done at what we call the PPA level, the program, project, or activity. Every single line item had to take the chainsaw approach, as, as, uh, General, as Admiral Winnefeld said yesterday. Um, this sequestration is at the account level. That means the appropriation account level. That means the chainsaw actually just cuts off, for example, O&M Army, MILPERS Air Force, and MILPERS can be exempt, by the way, so that would be zero, and then everybody else would get a bigger cut, or Ship Construction Navy. It doesn't say every line item in the Ship Construction Navy procurement account has to have an equal effect, right? The Pentagon has considerable flexibility. The President has considerable flexibility. It's also, by the way, easy to conceive of an agreement which would relieve the pain of sequestration by providing even additional flexibility, including perhaps some modest flexibility year over year, so you could slip some of FY13 into 14 and beyond. The other part of that equation, though, is that unlike all those other drawdowns, we have today present as part of the dynamic the global financial market. Right? We had, I mean, the reason we got the Budget Control Act and the sequestration reductions is because of the threat of default over the debt ceiling. Now, where I don't remember the exact clock ticking, I think the President submitted uh, his request to increase the debt ceiling uh, on the day that the House came back, so that would have been uh, Monday uh, a week ago. So the 15-day clock will probably ex re be reached next Tuesday, and that means on, I presume, on something like Wednesday morning, uh, our debt ceiling as a nation will go up $1.2 trillion, um, failing the passage by the Senate of a resolution of disapproval uh, and the override of an expected President's veto of that. That's not going to happen. So the debt ceiling will go up, up until we hit it again. Now, when are we going to hit it again? Well, that depends on how the economy is doing. Good news this morning, right, 2.8 percent GDP growth in the fourth quarter, um, which is a big bump over uh, the under 2 percent of the previous two quarters, and that indicates probably a little more revenue, a little less expenditure, a little pressure off how quickly we're going to reach the debt ceiling. Woe unto us if we actually reach that debt ceiling uh, during the lame duck session after the election, because that throws all of this calculation into a cocked hat. But we'll assume, uh, as CBO and, and uh, OMB are doing, sufficient growth rates in the economy that that we won't reach that. Let's just hope reality keeps up with our estimates, if you will. So let me make some points then. I think several of, of the panel here noted that uh, we've got the strategic guidance or the strategy. We have the initial uh, uh, information from the Secretary of Defense and the Pentagon, but we're still missing the real element here, which is the budget itself. And we've got three weekends and, and uh, two weeks left before we see that, February 13th, Monday. Um, it'll be the third time in, in four years that this administration has been late in submitting the budget, um, but, uh, but that's the way it is. So we'll get to see that information. What should you be looking for in that budget as it comes forward? Number one is, as, as Todd mentioned, the question of efficiencies. There's $60 billion that the Secretary cited, and he cited as the basis of those efficiencies, and you won't be able to find this as a line item in the budget. You have to look at a lot of programs, you know. Aggressive and competitive contracting practices. Um, now, that is actually not really an efficiency. That is, in fact, a tightening on margin and fee, and presumably on performance. Um, better use of information technology. Well, ever since we created information technology, we have saved money by taking money out of the budget in anticipation of better use of information technology. Um, and I won't be surprised if we do that again. Streamlining the staff. 
Um, I will confess to be totally baffled as to how I'm going to be able to tell whether you've done that or not. Um, I know what getting rid of staff means. Right? <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean streamlining. Reductions in contract services. This is probably, again, not line items, right? Most contract services are paid for out of the operation and maintenance account. There's no definitive uh, uh, display of that in the, in the budget. Um, but there are some disturbing trends already underway in the industry itself. And it isn't actually a, an elimination of contracts. It's a de-scoping of the requirements for the positions. And I suspect many of you out there who work in these contract environments are seeing this already. The Pentagon is saying, you know what, I really don't need a master's degree with 10 years of experience in that job. I can take a bachelor's degree with three years of experience, with a commensurate reduction in, in fact, the anticipated cost of that. Um, that's fine, as long as, in fact, that three-year experience bachelor's degree person can do the job. Let us hope that somebody made that evaluation before they de-scoped the requirements. Um, let us not, in fact, be blinded, though, by false optimism in that regard. And then finally, better inventory management. And again, this has been a hallmark. Uh, I've only been at this business for about 35 years. We've been preaching better inventory management the entire time. What are efficiencies really? Well, they're what the Australian calls efficiency dividends. That means we took the money out. Now you figure out how to be more efficient. So that's what you're going to look for in, in the budget. Um, the second is, in fact, I think, some of the unanswered questions. There's a, a, this was a difficult budget process, in part because the start point wasn't really determined until these guys were already wrapped up. And then they had to go back and, and take into account uh, what the Congress had already acted on. As a result, a lot of the fiscal year 13 issues that you'll see in the budget were solved by punting them into fiscal year 14 and beyond. Right? You won't have much visibility of that, but you'll have a number of hints on those things. And I think over the course of the congressional review cycle for both the Authorization Act and the appropriations, many of those punted issues will come to light. Why? Because the Pentagon has to start coming to grips with those fiscal year 14 issues almost immediately. They're already starting to work at the military departments on the fiscal year 14 budget and fit up. And it's critical that they get that in place. And that's where the impact of failing to account for the additional reductions, whether it's through sequestration or something else, begins to have real long-term consequences. The final piece is, uh, is I have to say something about base closures. Um, I've spent, you know, a quarter of a century uh, heavily involved in the base closure process. Um, I received an email yesterday from someone uh, who reminded me of a quote I had made uh, three months ago. Quote, you're never going to see a BRAC requested in an election year, especially a presidential election year. Um, I, I obviously, um, I have to eat those words. It is a presidential election year, and I think in, uh, on February 13th, and the Secretary said it yesterday, we'll see a base closure request. Um, the viability of that request remains to be seen, but there's one particular point that the Pentagon has failed yet to perceive. Um, the base closure round is part of their first objective, if you will, in, in their strategic review. There is also, in fact, an, a, a push for an expanded overseas basing presence as part of the second element of the strategic review. From the Pentagon's point of view, these two are not connected. You can be making reductions for efficiency purposes of, with your domestic infrastructure at the same time as you're expanding your overseas infrastructure for better deployment of Navy and Air Force assets in the Pacific, et cetera. But from a congressional point of view, these two are, in fact, absolutely linked together. And, and we have seen this in every previous base closure round where the typical mentality, whether you're from Texas or Montana or South Carolina or wherever, that you have a base that might be threatened, you say, you know what? Before you close my base, why don't you go get those blank aircraft in blank base overseas and bring them home and put them here instead? And, and until and unless the Pentagon does a better job of reconciling that uh, dispute, uh, we're not likely to see uh, movement forward. Um, there's also a question of the role of politics here. And, and you know, each passing administration, each passing uh, election cycle sees a little bit more penetration of politics into the Pentagon. And many of you have been at this uh, over the course of careers um, uh, that stretch back over decades, and we've all witnessed this, if you will. Um, the, the attempts over the last uh, month or so to align the White House's own objectives with the Pentagon's objectives are actually uh, worth lauding, if you will. It's useful to have some alignment, if you will. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 
the political folks need to be a little bit careful. Uh, historically, the greatest contribution that the Defense Department can make to any election campaign is, in fact, to be allowed to do its job very, very well. And that was the fundamental premise on which the framers created uh, the branches of government in the first place and set up the friction between the executive and legislative branches. And I think it behooves us as we move forward here to be able to separate out those decisions and activities that are being driven for political purposes and those that actually contribute significantly to the capability to provide for the national security of the United States. So I'll close my remarks at that point um, and, and we'll prepare to open the floor for questions. So let me just remind you of the process, if you will. Um, we have microphones here. We'd like you to uh, um, wait for the microphone so that, in fact, the audience on the web and on television can uh, hear you as well. You raise your hand. I will recognize you uh, by pointing to you and saying something. Wait for the mic. If you would do two things, one is identify yourself by giving me your name and identify your affiliation. And if you don't have any, then you can do what a registered independent in Maryland does and call yourself non-affiliated. Um, so uh, why don't we uh, start? I think we've got a couple of questions here in the front. Uh, wait for the mic here. Let's do the one on, on that side first, and then you just pass it across the, the aisle there. Good morning, da David. Thanks for taking the question. Jeremy Devaney, BB&T Capital Markets. Uh, this question is actually directed more towards Todd and Clark. Um, we've heard a lot about the consequences of sequestration, a and yesterday the question was asked at the Pentagon about whether or not they're planning for sequestration, but again, the response was consequences and not the plan. I was wondering if you could either expand on Clark's comments about the alternatives to sequestration, but do you see a logical path for legislative rollback of sequestration, and, and what do you think the DOD is doing to plan for sequestration, and how is industry reacting? Yeah, I mean, you know, let's talk about the alternatives to sequestration. Um, you basically, here's how it lays out: the Super Committee failed to find 1.2 trillion in deficit reduction. That means, under the law, uh, you're going to find they're going to take 1.2 trillion out of the budget. Uh, they do that by allocating half the cuts to defense, half the cuts to non-defense. Of the $600 billion allocated to defense, you get to take out 18% for interest savings because you're not going to be borrowing as much over the years. So now you're down to $492 billion. Uh, it applies to what's called the, uh, the 050 budget function. That include 96% of that budget function is DOD. Uh, the other 4% uh, goes to the Department of Energy uh, for nuclear weapons stockpile, things like that, and a few other government agencies. Uh, so of the $492 billion uh, that you actually have to cut, uh, not about 96% of that would presumably come out of DOD, although there is some flexibility there. So now you're talking about $472 billion that has to come out of DOD, and it has to be evenly divided over the next nine years. That's what the law says. So it ends up being about $52 billion uh, would have to come out of the DOD budget. So. FY13 budget, $525 billion. You'd have to take another 52. Uh, it says you have to have a uniform cut across all the accounts. Uh, it ends up being about 10% uh, cut. You can exempt MILPERS, but then all the other accounts have to be cut by a greater amount. Uh, now, with that said, what can, you know, what can you do to avoid the uh, messiness of that and the untargeted and, and unstrategic nature of these across-the-board cuts? Uh, well, you're going to need the cooperation of Congress to do anything. But first of all, the Pentagon could submit an, uh, a budget amendment, if you will, uh, that comes in at the $52 billion reduced number. Now, technically, the way the law is written for FY13, the sequester is a little different. It's going to take the $52 billion no matter how much you appropriate below uh, the cap. Uh, so what you'd have to do is you write your bill, uh, your appropriation bill, so that it comes in at the lower number, and then at the very bottom you say increase every account in here by about 11 percent. Then sequestration hits, it cuts it by 10 percent, you end up where you want it to be. What's the advantage of doing that? I mean, I know it's a game, but that's how you have to do these things. The advantage there is simply that you got to target the cuts. Uh, that's better than untargeted, but it's still going to be tough to do. Uh, it's about a 10 percent reduction. Uh, okay, what are some other alternatives if you want to avoid that? Well, as the president said, that he's not going to take up the pressure 
take off the pressure of the Congress to, to handle the deficit. Uh, so what could you do that's deficit neutral to alter sequestration to make it a little easier for DOD? You could reallocate the cuts across the years. So instead of coming down suddenly uh, in FY13 and then basically staying flat at that lower level the rest of the decade, you could make it a gradual decline that achieves the same dollar amount of savings over the decade. I ran some calculations. You would have to decline the, uh, decline the defense budget at about a 2 percent uh, real rate, so adjusting for inflation, a 2 percent decline in real terms uh, over the rest of the decade. That gives you about the same level of total uh, savings as you would uh, under sequestration. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a more gradual ramp down. That would be a little smoother, a little easier for DOD. The, yeah, the way the law is written, uh, it doesn't take into account time value of money. It's $1.2 trillion, and all the numbers in there are in then-year dollars. So, yes, you're backloading the cuts uh, if you take the, the ramp-down approach I was just talking about. So the, you know, real reduction is less, but, you know, that's the way the law is written. Part two, part two of my original question. Is there actually a legislative process to avoid it? Changing the law. I mean, you have to change the law. The, the super committee was the legislative process to avoid it uh, that was uh, easiest to accomplish. The super committee had this unique authority to produce a plan that would get considered by the House and the Senate without amendments, and it was not going to be subject to the 60-vote uh, cloture rule in the Senate. Uh, that was the easiest way to avoid this. That opportunity has passed. So now Congress is going to, if they want to avoid this or want to modify sequestration, it's the regular, leg regular legislative process, and they've got to get 60 votes in the Senate to do anything. The only thing I would add to that is that, as Todd pointed out quite accurately, the only way you can change it is change the law. What are the circumstances under which the law might be changed? Well, they reach a bargain. Bargaining hasn't stopped. You know that every one of these organizations, including up on the Hill, including more public ones like this one here at CSIS, you know, have teams out there thinking about life beyond sequester, you know, and how to deal with that. So there's two kinds of deals that are out there. One is the deal for the 1.2 trillion. The other deal is the grand bargain, where most, uh, I think, uh, outside analysts say that we need between three and four billion dollars worth over 10 years of deficit reductions and in revenue increases, otherwise known as tax increases. Um, if there is a grand bargain, defense will be part of that because it represents 40 percent plus of discretionary spending. You don't get there without defense. So I think that there is at this time, as I said, a subtle form of the Washington Monument strategy. Why you didn't see big gaudy cuts in this first round is they're being saved for the second round of negotiations about what will replace sequester. And it can either be a sequester size deal for how you get that extra $600 billion demanded by the, the Budget Control Act, or it can be two and a half to $3 billion that actually addresses the budget deficit fiscal crisis that this country's in. I know we want to get to the next question, but let me, let me just also emphasize that part of that process of the bargain and the debate and the compromise has to take into account what do the ratings agencies think about this. Um, and this has never been part of our equation before. Go back to November 21st when the supercommittee failed and they announced that, in, in fact, we're going to have to move towards sequestration. From the point of view of the ratings agencies, Moody's and Fitch's and Standard and Poor's, um, this was irrelevant. The dollars were still coming out. Didn't really matter to them where, right? From the point of view of solvency of the U.S., this is fine. Now, if we're not careful, and I'm not quite sure how Congress can be careful on this matter, if we start sending the wrong signals at the wrong times and it provokes a reaction by the ratings agencies that says, you know what, you guys have just crossed a line, a line you didn't know was there, a line we didn't define for you ahead of time, a line that may in fact be subjective and irrelevant, but nonetheless visible, public, and with potential significant impact. Um, this is a different part of the equation, if you will, and, uh, and one that I think, in other words, you can't just let defense off the hook without finding that $475 billion somewhere else. So 
Next question. Uh, George Nicholson with Strat Corp. This is basically for Todd, but also for, for Clark. Todd, you mentioned that the pain and where the, where the cuts are, for instance, retire all the C5As, terminate C27, retire a large number of C130s, reduction of six, 60 squadrons, and potentially the BRAC. For the Nash Air National Guard, I think that's going to be an absolutely red flag. And how much of a contentious issue is that going to be with their, with their lobby? Uh, on the uh, on the hill of, of handling that uh, yeah I mean I think it's going to be a big issue um, you know you cited a lot of the cuts uh, and, you know in the Air Force and you know I'll admit my bias here as a former Air Force reservist and I was in a wing where we had C5As um, yeah they're going to be taken um, you know I think uh, you're going to see a lot of pushback uh, you know, once the guard and reserve lobbying, you know, groups uh, get mobilized, uh, I think that they have a lot of influence on the Hill. Uh, so I think we're going to see a real fight uh, about, you know, where those cuts occur in the Air Force. I don't think this is a done deal. I don't really have anything to add to that. Yeah. Um, do you still have the mic, George, or has anybody picked up the mic? Let, let's, let's go over here to the right. Uh, my right, that is, and then we'll come back to the middle here. We've got two guys over here. Uh, Byron, you get the mic first and then pass it forward. Okay, David, we'll want to ask you a question first, and then, and then Todd. But Make sure you, uh, I identified yes, yes. you, but that's not adequate for our audience. Byron, <laughs> <laughs> Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. Um, David, when you looked at the program changes that were discussed yesterday, was there anything that struck out as a risk for the industrial base? And Todd, did you think differently on what the glide slope and the investment accounts may be in 13 and 14 um, from what we had in, in 12 based on what came out yesterday? The, uh, the industrial base question is, is really intriguing here. Um, I, I think what we saw is, is some evidence of potential concern. What we've had the Pentagon tell us now, both with the January 5th strategic guidance and in connection with yesterday's announcement, is that there's an increased consideration of industrial base concerns as these decisions are being made. Um, that's all well and good. The real question is not is there increased consideration, but do you actually change a decision to reflect that increased consideration? And as of yet, we, we have no evidence that any such change in decision was made. But let me give you one example, and this is what you need to know the rest of the details for. Announced yesterday the termination of Global Hawk Block 30. That clearly puts some elements of the supplier base at risk. The real question of what that level of risk is depends on what's happening in the budget with Global Hawk Block 40, with BAMs, with other programs that would have essentially a similar supplier base, a similar uh, component structure in place. And we don't yet know the answer to that question. One might assume, if one wanted to give them credit for having that additional consideration, that in fact looking at across the board the, the, the um, uh, UAV infrastructure that supports these large planes, in fact, is probably sustained. But we don't yet know. So that's kind of what we have to, uh, to look for in that equation. You know, and, and I give them great credit uh, for at least saying the right words and saying we've got to take into account uh, what these cuts are going to mean for the defense industrial base, and we've got to take action where necessary to preserve critical, vital sectors of the industrial base. The devil, of course, is in the details. Uh, the reality is, in this budget environment, you can't do everything everyone would want you to do to preserve every sector of the defense industrial base. Uh, so the question is, you know, not what do you cut, but what do you keep? Uh, and we don't really know yet what they're talking about doing. Um, they at least talked about monitoring, but I don't think that is quite sufficient. Um, but you know, in terms of the procurement and RDT and E accounts, we don't really know enough yet to say. Uh, based on what they said yesterday, my hunch is that procurement is going to take a, a steeper cut than other parts of the budget. They're talking about protecting your, you know, S and T investment, uh, investment, you know, in your R and D seed corn, if you will. Um, so if they do that, then our R D T and E may not take as much of a cut as procurement. But I think that's all we can really say at this point. Uh, I'll put in a plug here. We do plan here at, at CSIS on Wednesday, the 15th of February to have an event specifically focused on the industrial base implications of the defense budget, assuming they actually do release it on the 13th, um, <coughs> as is currently planned. And so we'll, we'll be able to sort of answer our own questions and, and many of yours as well uh, at that point in time. Uh, let's go up in the front here. Rich, McFar Rich McFarland with Parsons. Um, the, 
other gorilla in the room besides sequestration is a CR. And we are heading that way into a perfect storm of issues that have to be addressed. Uh, and I personally see a, uh, another six to eight months CR that we experienced last year. Do you know if the department and the rest of government is in uh, trying to prepare some kind of strategy to deal with that in terms of maybe prioritizing procurements, rescheduling procurements, et cetera? Uh, and if not, please ask them to do so. And that was really, <laughs> that's really after you, Stephanie. <laughs> To be honest, I think the executive branch has been so wrapped up in what we've been seeing lately that they haven't given it much thought. Um, and this could be the former legislative staffer in me going, you know, come on, guys. Um, I think you're right. We will be seeing CRs. I tend to think it will be longer than eight to nine months. Um, I think for defense, you're looking at a year-long CR. Um, for other parts of government, it'll be shorter and there'll be much gnashing of teeth. Um, I, I think you make some very good points. We will take that message back to people we talk to. There, there are a couple of uh, other aspects to it. One, obviously, the real wild card there is who wins in November, right? Not only at the presidential level, but in terms of, of the uh, will, will the Republicans take back the Senate? Uh, will it be a tighter margin in the House or a larger margin? Um, the incentives for making a decision during the lame duck session will be directly driven by what happens in the first Tuesday in, in November. The other thing, though, is that the difference between a CR level, which is basically continue FY12 funding into FY13, and the FY13 request is pretty minimal. And so as long as there are enough anomalies written, written into the continuing resolution so that the Defense Department can, in fact, make the adjustments that it planned to do for fiscal year 13, um, the potential impact would not necessarily be that great absent the $52 billion of sequestration. So, the uncertainty freezes the customers, and, and you know, programs tend to take one of two very diametrically opposed views here. One is, I don't know what my future money is going to look like, and so I'm going to be very prudent and go slow and be very cautious and, and slow everything down. Um, the other dynamic is, I don't know what my future money is going to look like, so I better spend every nickel I've got right now before they take it away from me. Um, that's going to be kind of a program by program dynamic, and we really can't predict where that's going to go. Um, I think we've got another question back up here in, in the front here. Peter Sharfman, Miter Corporation. Uh, getting back to the sequestration, would the unprecedented degree of flexibility that you described give the Defense Department a once in a generation opportunity? to cut things that have been sacred cows in Congress. Is this the chance to cut the program in the subcommittee chairman's district? What an astonishingly clever question. <laughs> it, it sort of reminds me of, you know, Richard Nixon's secret plan for ending the war in Southeast Asia. Um, it would certainly potentially provide a once in a century opportunity to do that sort of thing. Um, I will tell you, though, I, I see not only no indication that anybody is willing to step up to that, um, but I suspect that the bulldozers lined up outside the building, if that were to occur, would materialize very, very quickly, and we'd see some elimination. However, what it does do, Peter, is it provides the opportunity, I think, for um, those of us who want to contribute to the discussion and provide advice, as, as Rich noted earlier, um, to begin thinking a little more creatively about what kind of flexibilities you'd need to have in order to actually execute this. The thing I think we all agree is that this is not the end of the reductions. And in fact, even though the document uh, that was released by the Pentagon yesterday said that, if you look at the words in the transcript, General Dempsey called this a down payment. That implies, at a minimum, a second payment, right? Um, Secretary Panetta called it the beginning. That implies, at a minimum, some subsequent steps, if you will. So I think there's a recognition this is not the end of the game. The fight over sequestration is not a fight necessarily over no reductions. It's a fight over the process for doing that. And what you've indicated is uh, kind of the stakes of that process is really some game changers, not just strategy, but other things. Stephanie and then Clark. If I could just comment on the political environment in which we're operating. Um, going back to something Todd said, which was there aren't a lot of surprises in what we've heard yesterday. Um, I don't think we're going to have a lot of surprises. It may be a, a great opportunity 
if you look at the, the broader strategic con uh, construct of can you actually cut programs that have been sacrosanct or sacred cows in the past? Um, there, there is that opportunity, but the political will, in my view, doesn't necessarily exist. And I, and I go back to who will want to sacrifice something in their district in an election year where it is so very partisan right now, because it's a zero-sum game, um, in, in perception at least. If I lose, you win. If I lose, my opponent wins. For, for a host of reasons, but purely just political. I'm a policy wonk. In a policy world, this wouldn't be so hard. Um, but it's not reality, and that's just my perspective on it. I think that um, we've had many heroic programmers in the past who have used these kind of financial crises to cut programs that might have been sacrosanct. Negative funding wedges have been built into many palms, and then when either that heroic programmer was brought down to size, or he left, because we have a fairly rapid transition of people, there's broken glass all over the floor from these negative funding wedges. So I don't think people are doing that. I think that's a practice that's uh, gotten just too risky. But I do believe, and I mentioned this before, is that there is a common understanding that we have to do something about paying benefits, that it's unsustainable. And I do think that this is an opportunity where they are hopeful of reaching some kind of an agreement with Congress, either through the commission or through other means as well, where they're able to at least cap the growth so that it leaves room in the budget to actually equip and train the forces that we're going to retain. So I think that that's something that's big enough, uh, that the building is de desperate enough to handle that could be addressed at this time. And the commission that the Defense Department proposed yesterday was solely on retirement. Uh, our work, and I think all, all, all of our work up here, says that's too narrow a boundary. You've got to actually look at retirement changes in the context of a broader pay and benefits uh, approach that cuts across the board. And the idea of a BRAC-like process, I think, really means produce a result that's an all or nothing up or down vote. There are other elements of the BRAC process that probably also should be incorporated here, including robust public opportunity for input and debate and an opportunity for the members who would be uh, uh, potentially damaged by this to have visible active resistance so that at the end of the game they could say, we did all we could. Um, can I just add one note yeah. to that real quick? Uh, you know, I, I think that's exactly right, that the retirement commission is not quite enough. You really need to broaden it uh, to look at military compensation uh, comprehensively. Uh, and I think the key thing that we need to do here, like I said before, it shouldn't just be about what do you cut. It should be about where can you get better value. If you're going to do that, you've got to get data. You've got to understand how service members actually value the various forms of compensation they get. And it is a, a complex mesh of different forms of compensation. That's something the department uh, has actually been reluctant to do. It's not something you can accomplish through focus groups or just talking to senior enlisted leaders. Uh, you've really got to go out uh, and, and get input from a, a broad uh, sector of the department. I, I will take a, a moment here to, to plug a study that we're doing. Uh, we're actually trying to do this. Uh, we're conducting a survey of military personnel uh, where people can go in, it's an online survey, uh, and they can actually start to show us uh, their utility curves, if you will, for very diff you know, different forms of compensation. And then they make trade-offs in the tool of would you prefer a little more of this and a little less of that or uh, some other combination of benefits. Uh, it's online. We encourage uh, people in the military or family members or retirees to go to it, csbamillsurvey.org. Uh, is the website. Uh, we need to get a lot of results and once we've got that, uh, we're going to share that uh, with leaders here in Washington and in the department uh, and, and forums like this in the future. Um, we're going to be at this for a, a little while longer, but uh, Todd Harrison has to leave shortly for another commitment. So um, if there's a question, particularly on this side of the room, which I haven't gotten to yet, that, that you want to direct towards uh, Todd, this would be the right opportunity uh, to do that. I do see one here. Um, if you would bring the mic up there, Terrence. Thank you. Otto Kreischer with Sea Power Magazine. Todd, on your, you said earlier 17 Navy ships cut in a fit up. Which ones are you counting? Because there's also a program uh, drawdown in, uh, in LCS and in the uh, joint high speed vessels, in addition to retiring um, you know, the cruisers and, 
and the and the amphibs. You know, where do you get your 17? I, I got it from the department, uh, <laughs> straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't have the the list of how it all adds up. I think you know they're cutting what seven cruisers, slipping two LCS, slipping a Virginia class sub, uh, joint high speed vessel. There are a number of ships involved here, uh, but that's the number that they're using that they're taking out uh, over the fight up. Uh, and that is, that is a significant change. Uh, from what had been planned previously. And I think that that just goes to reinforce the fact that, that uh, these cuts are not being solely put on the Army uh, and the Marine Corps. The Air Force and the Navy uh, are taking a, a share of the cuts as well. All right. Any other questions? We are, ah, we do have, we've got one and uh, let's, let's, mm -hmm. oh, we have down front over here. I'm sorry. It's that it's the the lights are so kind to me that I actually can't see people right in front. So let, let's go over here. Thanks. Hi, I'm Emily Rutherford, Defense Daily. Um, Stephanie talked about reversibility, and I'm wondering if the if the other panelists have any thoughts on that, concerns on that, and also just how how you're defining it or what you understand it to be. I, I mean, I think reversibility can mean a lot of things. Um, the the key question, you know, is how are they doing it. Uh, reversibility also implies that there will be some cost. Uh, so, you know, in, in taking down uh, end strength in the Army and Marine Corps, they've said that they're going to try to protect uh, the mid-level officers and NCOs. And that's smart, because if you do need to rebuild uh, your forces quickly, uh, those are the people you need in order to train new recruits that are coming in. Uh, but it's still, you know, it's never without a cost. Those personnel are more expensive uh, than junior personnel. So now uh, your mix of personnel will be changing so that your cost per person, your average cost is going to be a little higher because you're keeping more uh, of those middle rank people. Uh, the same is true with the defense industrial base. Uh, you can, you know, cut programs uh, and then make some investments that mitigate uh, you know, the downside to the industrial base. But often what will happen is you know, your unit costs will go up um, and you'll be paying money in some cases to support overhead and infrastructure capacity in the industrial base and skills in the industrial base that you're not actively using. Um, and, you know, there's, there are good reasons to do that, uh, but it gets hard to defend that uh, in front of Congress year after year. So there are definitely risks involved with doing it. Just a brief word on that. I wouldn't pay too much attention to the word itself as promising uh, a new concept. This is a case of thesaurus inflation that Todd referred to before. We used to hedge against things. We used to ask against what if questions. It's also true when you turn to the joint world, we used to synchronize things. Now it's synergy. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a different adverb that presumably, or a different adjective that presumably connotes more content than it really does. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Uh, I got two questions on the back row there. If we can uh, take the first and then pass the mic over to the second one. A quick, a quick comment, really, for Todd, although he's gone. Uh, his comment about uh, uh, the, the mid-level officers. During the post-World War I period, when the German army virtually did not exist, they kept, really kept, their, their mid-level officers. And guess what? They expanded really quickly, quickly after that, because they kept their core. Yes, uh, Bill Courtney with Computer Sciences Corporation. Uh, last July, the Defense Business Board recommended that if DOD followed uh, private sector corporate downsizing policies, it could save 5 to 15 percent without affecting readiness. Is there any sign that DOD has taken that recommendation on board or rejected it? Are any of the, uh, fi uh, any of the new data uh, in the release yesterday suggestive that that Def Defense Business Board recommendation is being pursued? Yeah, are there any signs that it's been rejected? Uh, no, there's been no explicit uh, rejection that I'm aware of. Obviously, none of us can really speak for the Defense Business Board. Um, I think some of the language that were, was used in the announcement yesterday, uh, I actually saw, I think for the first time in a long time, uh, the phrase reduction in overhead, 
Um, that's an intriguing one to me because there is, in fact, no identification or line item anywhere in the defense budget that's called overhead. So it's a little hard for us to validate and verify that such reductions have taken place. Um, nonetheless, I think the mentality is, is potentially there, uh, Bill, and, and I, I still hold out some hope. Uh, for a recognition that one of the ways in which you reduce the budget is actually to figure out things that you're not, that you're doing that aren't adding a lot of value and just simply stop doing them. Um, but we'll see whether that actually occurs when it comes forward. Um, got a question down here in front. Thank you. Sandra Erwin with National Defense Magazine. I wanted to ask Clark a question about you, the comment you made on a grand bargain that would be necessary at some point uh, to fix a deficit. I mean, if, if hypothetically that were to, to happen, what kind of cuts would you foresee for defense that would be on the table, potentially, uh, would be politically acceptable? And uh, can, do you have a number in mind for that? People pull grand bargain out of the hat to describe any really serious problem that if you're going to solve it, you have to bring in a lot more into the picture. I think the first time with respect to this it was brought in was last July and August when President Obama and Speaker Boehner were talking about a deal that was much bigger than 1.2 to 1.5. They were talking about a deal that was twice as big. And so how do you get there? Well, you have a grand bargain. Uh, now, what determines what the grand bargain looks like? Um, we're trying to think through here at CSIS, the beginning of a process will take us six or seven months because uh, it'll take that long, but we also figure this is something that's going to be relevant after the election because you can't have a grand bargain until you know who your bargainers are, and we're not going to know that until after the election. Um, but I think that that's that sort of behind the scenes and any new president or any new administration coming in knows that if they don't address this at that level, we're going to have another four years that looks like the last two, and I don't think anyone wants that. Uh, so to me, a grand bargain just means how do you generate a combination of spending reductions and tax increases that add up to a total of about $4 billion. Um, that's a lot of money. Uh, projected over how many years, I don't know. And that's why I think with the Defense Department and the actions they've just taken, is you see a recognition that they're one of the big stakes in this bargain, because they represent 40% plus of discretionary spending. So there's no way you have a grand bargain uh, without avoiding more of it. And so one of the reasons why I don't think you saw big gaudy cuts like a carrier or something in this first round is they know there's a second round. They know at a minimum there's a second round to what we do to avoid the sequester cut. But everybody knows there's a grand bargain out there that we hope, we all hope, uh, addresses the fiscal crisis uh, that this country faces. Uh, and I think there's an awful lot of jockeying going on now to determine where it is. As to what my personal ideas are, uh, stay tuned. Another six months, I hope to have them. I'm, I'm going to bring the microphone kind of to the middle in the back and then down forward while the, while the mic is uh, uh, moving forward. So, uh, Terrence, that, uh, raise your hand higher. Thanks. Um, while the mic is moving that way, let me point out that we've been talking this morning as if the debate on Capitol Hill over the fiscal year 13 defense budget is going to be whether to fund the request that the President makes or to cut it further. That's not the debate that's going to occur. The debate that's going to occur is going to be whether to add money back, all right? And so the fundamental underlying reality, which is between the FY13 level and something lower that we've spent our time talking about here this morning, is not going to be reflected, particularly in the House, when the debate is over whether or not the Defense Department cut too much and it ought to be added back. So the disconnects between the grand bargain and the reality we face today are going to be amplified by, in fact, a perceived debate that's largely irrelevant to those long-term reductions, but very relevant to the programs and cuts that are embedded in that budget in the first place. So with that, Howie. 
yeah, how we learned from Floor Corporation, and actually that's this question is right directly with commenting about what you just said re regarding contingency operations overseas. I know that they've there's less going to Afghanistan than last year for you know next year and beyond, but you know we've seen the last ten years the model is that you know conflicts the war fighters go in companies in this room get hired to support them logistically and base life support. Is there anything else described and talked about in the budget you know, for regarding future conflicts other than just reduction from the Afghanistan account? What I found remarkable yesterday is um, finding the word contractor somewhere, anywhere, was impossible. Um, and so what this means to me is either it's something that they don't want to talk about, um, and there's been a general reluctance to talk about um, reliance, and I won't say over-reliance, but just reliance on contractors for base operation, base operating support and other logistical type support that they receive in Afghanistan and, to be honest, in so many other places around the world. Um, I think um, this is a debate that really does need to happen. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the, the authorizing committees take this up as part of the, okay, you're cutting end strength and you're not going to be doing stability operations on a long, prolonged basis, but we need to be involved, so how are we going to do it? And contractors will come up um, in, in terms of stability operations and, and others. And so from my perspective, I think as we move forward, just watch this space. I find it remarkable that you can have an entire press conference and not really talk about it. Um, when it's been such a topic over the last few years, and David, you might have a different view on this, but um, from my perspective, it's a conversation that we need to have in the next weeks, if not months. I would like to add one thing to that. Uh, uh, DOD put out a fact sheet. Now, I understand that using the word fact in conjunction with budgetary figures is perhaps uh, an oxymoron, but nevertheless, um, we used to project in terms of the out years, uh, $88 billion for OCO and FY13, then $50 billion, $50 billion, and $50 billion. They don't do that now. Now it's $88 billion in FY13. Why? Well, they're going to ask for $88 billion. And then there's TBD for all that, to be determined. So they're not making projections now about what future out years are going to look like because they don't know what future outlook years are going to look like. Um, let's take a question down here uh, in row four, and then I believe there might be one further back. Thank you, David. Cameron Luthi, unaffiliated. Um, Stephanie, in your opening remarks, you talked about uh, land ground forces and uh, possible future requirements. I if you look at the discussion we've had here, it seems to me that the Army, that the budget numbers that came out going down to 490K active seems pretty unrealistic to me. I think at the end of the day, we're going to be a lot lower than that. Could you talk about strategy, land, ground forces, and, and your ideas about that, please, a bit? Absolutely. Um, thank you for that question. It's a, it's a concern when you, when you look at the glide path for the end strength. You're really talking about 490,000 uh, Army soldiers in 2017. So we're not talking about 2013 at this point, right? We're talking about over, over the next few years. But from a strategy perspective, I go back to what are the kinds of engagements we're expecting our armed forces to operate in going in the future. Um, they're not going to be, hopefully, an Iraq and Afghanistan kind of situation. But certainly, you can't rely on relatively scarce special operations forces to take care of all of the training, advising, assisting that we are going to be expected to do. Um, 490, I think, by 2017 might be a realistic number, but it really depends on what the next few years show us. Um, and this goes back to Clark's earlier point is, if you have a strategy that requires adjustment every year or so, what kind of strategy is it? Um, my concern about this current strategic guidance is that it talks about we're not going to be doing prolonged um, stability, large-scale stability operations on a rotational basis going forward. I see no evidence of that. Large-scale maybe, but prolonged, I think we're going to be in places in the world. Um, and the, the alternative is having friends and partners who are willing to do things that we aren't going to do. Um, and I'm not sure those conversations have happened. I think there's also, though, a, a parallel question, which is even if Stephanie's right and we're going to be engaged in a host of such operations around the world, and even if 
those operations actually require, as they will, contractor support. The, from the budgetary point of view, the question is, does it drive the force structure, or can you absorb it within the force structure that you have? And, and I think that's the question that they've tentatively answered in the abstract, but not analytically answered in the specific. Um, do we have any other questions? I've got uh, one in the front row here. I'm trying to see whether there's anybody on this side. All right. Uh, I think this will be our last question, and then we'll allow you to go out and uh, take advantage of the fact that the rain will be diminishing. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Zach Biggs with Defense News. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, there was some mention of the industrial base and the fact that Secretary Panetta has uh, mentioned the need to protect the industrial base moving forward. Do we know where that threshold is with slipping ships, with the JSF being pushed off a little bit, uh, when you do start to risk threatening those subcontractors who provide specialized parts? And if we do have a sense of that, how far are we from starting to really risk those subcontractors as we have the potential for further slips moving forward? Zach, that's a... a, a complex question um, in terms of do we know. No, we actually don't know, but let me tell you what we suspect. Um, what we suspect is, in fact, there are three elements to what the Pentagon has to do to be able to do a better job of thinking about the industrial base as it makes these cuts going forward. The first is actually a level of awareness, and that is an understanding of what all the elements of the industrial base are. There's a tendency, or has been historically for the last couple of decades, to focus on just the prime contractors as part of that process, when in reality, what we've seen over those same two decades is a migration of the prime contractor's share of the programs from maybe 60 or 70 percent uh, 15 years ago to maybe 30 or 40 percent today, with the rest being sustained by subcontractors. It's also true, of course, that a prime on one project is a sub on another, so there's a lot of mixing and matching. So the first question is, does the Pentagon have better information? I think the answer to that is yes. They've spent the last year with this sector-by-sector, tier-by-tier analysis. I suspect a number of you in this room have spent considerable amount of time and energy and perhaps cost uh, filling out the surveys that the Defense Department has sent out. The second question then is how do they actually use that information in the decisions? And that's kind of the question you've raised. Um, we've had uh, statements by the Defense Department that they have in fact done so. We can't yet validate uh, any instance, and we've asked them to validate instances where they have actually done so. The third is whether or not they actually did the right thing when they made those considerations, if you will, because ultimately what this is is a judgment call of how close to the edge of the cliff we will allow our industrial base to go before it falls off. And, and the history says pretty, pretty darn close. Uh, because we've got a, a very uh, a good idea that we have an ample supply of parachutes and we know how to give them to people as they're falling off. And, and you know, that's, a, that's a, a one interesting philosophy to maintaining the industrial base, but it's kind of a scary one for the participants in that process, and there's clearly some vulnerability going forward. Um, but I think there's actually a fourth question, and this is the one that really becomes important. You can't tell what parts of the industrial base you need to sustain unless you've got a clearer description of what it is you need this military for and what the role of the industrial base in providing that capability going forward. I think the strategic guidance that was issued on January 5th begins to make some small steps in that direction. It begins to answer a little bit the question of what do we need this military for, what are we going to plan to do with it. It begins to answer a little bit the questions of what are the demand signals being sent to industry and quite frankly it says don't invest quite as much in ground forces as you were planning on investing maybe two years ago. Maybe look a little more at, at air and sea. Maybe look a little more at innovation technology that you can put on the shelf and call reversibility. Um, none of that, in fact, is, is clear enough guidance that it would allow a company to tell where to spend its money and its investment today. That still needs to be determined. That will be determined not only by what comes out over the budget, but by the debate as it plays out over the rest of this calendar year to the election and beyond. And with that, I want to thank you all for joining us. We intend here at CSIS to continue probing all of these issues on a regular uh, and perhaps even uh, uh, too frequent basis. Um, but I, I think that the, the reality of the situation is that it's changing so fast that we've got to work pretty hard just to stay on top of what the dynamics are. Um, and, and we'll have uh, 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 numerous opportunities to revisit some of these questions as this um, fact sheet uh, becomes less speculation and more fact going forward. Thank you all very much for your attendance.